Welcome to this workshop. Um, as you know, this is Education and Global Health. Um, and uh, I'm Arthur Hibble. Um, I uh, now spend a lot of time in global health activities, was a GP and was a postgraduate general practice dean for the East of England. Um, the, just to remind you the, to keep yourself muted during the time of the first part of the workshop, the, um, use the chat to ask any questions or make any comments and we'll gather them up at the end. Um, just also to let you know that the, what appears in the chat now will also be kept in the Slack um, uh, channel as it's called uh, as we go along. So um, this uh, workshop, it will have two presenters um, who I'll introduce as they come on. Um, and uh, after the two presenters have 12 minutes each, we will have an open session when you can make comments, ask questions, and we'll have a panel discussion, which will be chaired by Bill Irish. Um, Bill um, had a career in general practice. He's now postgraduate dean for the East of England, um, has been extremely busy keeping our workforce together, although he's just saying they're all really quite quiet out there. Um, so um, um, you'll, you'll hear from him later. So um, without ado, let's uh, go on um, to um, uh, have Monica. Monica Abudan is um, a, uh, um, or was a, a computer scientist, now works in genomics at the uh, Genomic Pathogen Surveillance uh, Center. But she's here today because in fact, she runs a train the trainers course um, uh, for people who are associated with the, um, the Sanger Institute and it's a course is run by the, the Welcome. So Monica, over to you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think my talk should be, uh, should be played now, if you can help us with this, George. Hi guys, yeah, we're just gonna um, play that now. Thank you. I will, I will be here for questions later. Hello everyone, my name is Monica Abrutan and I am a scientist at the Center for Genomic Pathogen Surveillance at Sanger Institute. Today, I'm going to talk about the Train the Trainer course that was run last year in a collaboration between the Center for Genomic Pathogen Surveillance and the Welcome Advanced Courses and Scientific Conferences at the Welcome Campus near Cambridge. Today, I will present this course as a my model piloted for capacity building in genomic epidemiology in the LMICs. Hi Fiona, just checking in, it looks like it's paused. Okay. In regular training courses, participants learn about how to analyze information and then they apply. what they've learned to their own data. What we wanted to do in the Train the Trainer course was to introduce the concept of forward teaching. The goal was to train individuals who are embedded in national programs to be able to train other individuals to enhance their own national and regional AMR surveillance initiatives. Thus, the primary goal of this project was to start a global network of labs with existing AMR expertise and power them with tools to do genome sequencing and pathogen informatics. This is the course page and here are some photos taken during the event.
Before I move forward with the description of our course, I would like to clarify the actual potential of train the trainer courses. A trainer here in presented in a red circle can train a limited number of participants. These participants will gain individual skills, which they will apply to their own work. If the trainer teaches another trainer, then the impact is higher. And the impact can be even higher if she teaches a network of trainers. Assuming that the trainers in the network collaborate and support each other, this can build capacity over large geographic scales at national and regional levels. Moving on to our model piloted to deliver capacity in LMICs and to the course organizers. The organizers of the course were the welcome advanced courses and scientific conferences and the researchers at the Center for Genomic Pathogen Surveillance. The design of the course was based on the experience of us working as part of the Global Health Research Unit aimed to strengthen capacity in bioinformatics in Philippines, India, Colombia, and Nigeria. AMR is a great risk worldwide, so by partnering this way, combining our resources, expertise, and our Funding, it became easier to help build skills and capacity, particularly in the LMICs. I'm now moving on to the course participants. The Train the Trainer course was attended by 18 scientists working in academic research centers or national reference laboratories in 12 countries Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Cuba, India, Malaysia, Nigeria, South Africa, Sudan. Thailand, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Prior to developing of the course, the instructor team undertook the advanced learning and training program facilitated by an education expert from the advanced courses and scientific conferences program who provided pedagogical guidance in the development of the train the trainer course. Train the trainer course instructors also took into consideration the general expectation and characteristics of adult learners. Adult learners apply their knowledge and skills for solving immediate problems or tasks, have a unique background of knowledge and experience and prefer self-directing and control over individual learning. Learning by doing is important for adults and this was offered through hands-on exercises. Adult learners already have formed habits and preferred ways of learning. Thus, the course was designed to offer different types of activities for both group and individual work. Here I present the course structure. The course consists of 12 modules, which were run either in parallel or as joint sessions. The course ran over six days and included lectures, interactive sessions and seminars, adding up to 48 contact hours. Pedagogical elements were introduced throughout the course. The introductory modules in bioinformatics and whole genome sequencing laboratory techniques were run with the whole cohort of attendees, as well as the training and learning modules, which cover topics such as best training practices. Later, the participants were split into subgroups and attending spe uh, sessions specific to their interests. The laboratory work stream was dedicated to wet lab scientists and cover in detail all the processes that enable whole genome sequencing of bacterial pathogens from sample collection to sequencing quality assurance. The bioinformatics work stream covered a wide range of aspects starting from building the infrastructure and pipelines required for whole genome sequencing data analysis to interpreting newly sequenced genomes in global context. By design, the course supported social learning and teaching, where both the instructors that facilitated the training and the course participants took active roles and responsibilities for their own teaching and learning. Learning and teaching to several formats, direct training through presentation or demonstration, followed by Q&A sessions, group work, individual reflection and consolidation. As the course was in fact about training on many levels, the course instructors and facilitators model behavior to be adopted and adapted by the participants in their future teaching and learning. 
This slide is showing how we assign pedagogical learning outcomes to all modules, including the technical ones. In short, the course curriculum focused very much on the how to teach aspect, implemented active learning techniques, and gave the participants the opportunity to design their own modules using a pedagogy technique called project-based learning. In one of the exercises that involved active learning, we asked the participants to build a computer server that fulfilled certain requirements and had to be cost efficient. We gave them a list of random access memory specification, a list of CPUs and hard drives, and they had to combine these and come up with a server configuration. Their server options were later discussed in larger groups. We also developed active learning exercises specific to one of the streams. For this, for example, it's an exercise for bioinformaticians. In the first half of a module, we taught participants how to access data programmatically from the ENA, a database for genome data. In the second half of the module, participants were asked to design a model, module where they would have to teach how to access data from a similar but different database. So they had to think critically about how they were taught and how they would approach the same topic if they were asked to do so. Evaluation was carried out in two stages, immediately at the end of the course and six months after the end of the course. Firstly, a post-course survey asked participants about course organization, course contact, what participants most enjoyed in a course and any suggestions for changes of improvements. Participants were satisfied with the course materials and indicated that the course had been very relevant to, this, to their research. They felt, however, that networking time for discussion could be improved. Since participants were separated by work stream, a suggestion was made to provide a more overlapping structure whereby bioinformaticians could have an overview of project management approaches for laboratory pipelines. This is, uh, I will read now the feedback from a few of our participants. There is a lot of training in bioinformatics in my country, and it took me a while to get proper training. I would like to be able to share that. Another participant said, it is a very good integration of laboratory procurement and bioinformatics. I have never been on such a course like this before. It is very exciting. Another participant said, it's been a really enjoyable course. It's been very demanding, but the activities have really helped a lot. Having a theoretical session followed by an activity where you really apply the skills that you have been taught. And then you also have a framework for when you go home, back home. You can use those activities and everything that was done in class to preempt your design. Us training people is a very inefficient way of doing it. For them to go back and train in their own language will be by far the most effective way of doing it. Another trainer said, I think one of my favorite parts was to see participants from so many different countries and cultures working together, integrating into different exercises and bringing their different views on the same topic. In the second stage, a follow-up survey was conducted after six months to understand whether and how participants had applied their knowledge in their research or professional practice. Respondents, respondents indicated that they had implemented or were planning specific training in microbiology, AMR, sequencing, and bioinformatics techniques to a range of audiences, including university students, epidemiologists, and nat national level scientists involved in AMR surveillance. One of our course participants won a Cambridge Alborada Research Fund to start a training network in Southeast of Africa. And we were asked to be co-applicants and to offer mentorship. Another trainee in the trainer trainer course is delivering a course in genomic epidemiology in Latin America in a few weeks from now. The course is open to researchers with a degree in relevant dis uh, discipline, biologists, biochemists, medical doctors. We are planning to continue a mentoring scheme. We are also in the process of writing a paper on our experience in running trainer trainer courses in genomic epidemiology. We also uh, want to gather feedback, not just from our trainers, but also from their trainers. So practically we want to gather feedback on two levels and compile this in, into a research paper. In the end, I would like to thank everyone that was involved in 
uh, in putting uh, in designing and delivering this course. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, Arthur, you're on mute, sorry. Done it, right. Okay, thank you, Monica. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Lovely, okay. Um, thanks so much indeed. And uh, is there any questions for Monica? If you can make note of them now and we'll come back to that uh, later. Um, now we move on to Rika. Rika is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Education where she leads the CEDA research group, which is the strand of dialogue, professional change and leadership. And she does work uh, with um, professional learning, education, clinical settings. Um, and she is a, a fellow here at Hughes Hall. Rika. Thank you very much, Arthur. Just to note to George and Fiona that my screen sharing is disabled. Hi Fiona, will you be um, sharing the screens? Hi. I, no, I'm, I'm set to share my own screen, but it has not been enabled for me. No problem, we'll change that. Just give me a few seconds. Thank you. There you go, you should be able to start. There we go. Thank you very much. One of the interesting things about our use of the word global, term global, is that what we really mean, if that term is to be at all useful for us, is many locals instead of just one local. One of the challenges that poses for educational research is how do we link research, which in the traditional definition is meant to be global, so not just true for one particular local, but which at the same time to have any impact on practice in medical settings and medical education needs to be locally relevant. And the interactions and the relationship between research that has local relevance and research that has wider relevance is one of the key foci of my program of research. And what I'm going to share with you today is some of the findings from my and my colleagues' research on how we can build a locally responsive evidence-based approach to medical education and professional development in a range of settings. One of the key challenges in educational research informing medical education and professional development in clinical settings is that in many areas of medical education and even more so with regard to continuing medical education, we have a real shortage of high quality evidence. And even more so evidence that's relevant to a range of local settings in the global context. Some of the really common explanations as to why research is not informing practice, even when it exists, is a sort of a deficit model. So either we're saying practitioners don't want to follow the research, the research is not written up in a way that's helpful for practitioners, but a lot of these critiques really miss the nature of how educational practice changes and why it often doesn't change. But they also often miss the impact of local contextual factors to how research can be relevant. So one of the really key things we need to think about is what I call the implementation challenge. So research shows to us that even when practitioners want to change their practice, change often remains superficial. What I want to propose to you based on many research studies which I have led and been involved in over several years, is that we need to think of three ways of educational research for educational research to be able to inform practice in medical education and professional development. First one of those is thinking about research evidence on the particular aspect of education that we want to change. And this is typically what we traditionally focus on. So an aspect of medical education or professional development, faculty learning that we particularly want to address. However, 
It is my suggestion from my research on change in professional practice is that thinking about this dimension of educational research is not sufficient. The second dimension of educational research we need to think about is drawing on evidence that has something to say about how professional practice changes. How can we get medical educators to do things differently? How can we get faculty to interact with each other and our teams differently? How can we make that change happen? And the third dimension we need to be thinking about is how can local contexts themselves monitor the change processes so that they know if what they are doing is working in their local setting, even if it had already been shown to work in some kind of non-specific global setting. This is both for them to learn if their practice is actually improving, but also to secure them against local accountabilities as creating and trying to effect change in high accountability systems can often be quite risky for practitioners. And so the three areas that I want to say something about in terms of the relationship of research in medical education and changing medical education practice in the global health context are thinking about the evidence itself, implementation of that evidence to achieve new kinds of practices and outcomes and the evaluation of local change efforts. Firstly, with regard to the evidence, and particularly thinking about evidence that's both highly rigorous and locally relevant. Rigor is a very key issue because rigorous research, such as evidence from randomized controlled trials may not apply in every locality, but poor quality research does not apply anywhere. And we really need to focus on improving the research designs, methods and outcome measures that are used in our medical education research and research on professional development in clinical settings. But we also need to think about whether contextual factors have been attended to in that evidence. And the two particular things I want to highlight here. For evidence to be relevant for a local context, it needs to be able to address the problems of practice that medical educators in that locality perceive as being key to their work. And secondly, we need to look at the research and what it says about how contextual factors might impact the effectiveness of that research. So one of the things that medical education research shows is that students with lower prior knowledge learn less, but also that they learn differently from students with high prior knowledge. And given that there is a lot of evidence out there that suggests that one of the key challenges in particular many medical education settings in the global south is a fairly low prior knowledge level of many medical education students, if all of our research was done in the global north and particularly in places like Cambridge University, where we are now, where students who enter medical education programs generally have very high prior knowledge, then those findings may not be relevant in those other settings. What we need then is not only high quality randomized controlled trials and other experimental evidence, but we need theories of change. We need to know not only what works, but what, we, what might be the local barriers and opportunities for change. For example, with regard to students and their prior knowledges, but also their normative expectations of medical education and practice. The accountability systems that are relevant to practitioners within that local setting that shape what they are able to do and what new interventions they are able to take on. And the norms that influence colleagues and institutional ideologies that impact how people can work together with each other in any specific locality. Secondly then, implementation. We need evidence, not just of the practice that we want to be changing, but we need evidence on the mechanisms of professional learning and change that are relevant to making that pedagogic or educational intervention actually happen. And those need to be relevant to that local setting. There's one thing from our research that I would like to share with you with regard to this issue. And it is something that I have found in my research across many studies in both school and medical settings that I have captured as three paradoxes of professional change. The first one of those is the agency paradox. What we find time and again in studies that many educators as well as medical practitioners already in post very strongly think that they cannot affect change, that they individually do not have the agency to make change happen. And what we've seen is when individual believes that they cannot affect change, they don't try to affect change, Therefore, they don't achieve change 
and it reinforces their belief that they are not able to affect change. Even though when in our research we actually support people to try and affect change, they are always surprised as to how much more was possible than they had anticipated. And if we leave people to their own devices with this paradox, it will mean that implementation will not happen. The second one of the three paradoxes of professional change that my research suggests is the, what I've called the risk paradox. Is that in medical education settings, practitioners often don't sufficiently differentiate between risk to patient safety and personal and reputational risks that are inevitably part of any change effort. But when people are too cautious about reputational and personal risks because they mix those with patient safety risks and they don't try to affect change, then change becomes more risky for those few individuals who actually try and go ahead with it. And finally, the people paradox. When I speak to people who are meant to be entering clinical leadership roles, so not formal leadership roles, but trying to effect change as part of their frontline clinical practice, they tend to overly focus on other people who might be problematic for their change efforts and don't focus enough on people who could be a good resource and help them with their change efforts. And in overly focusing on those people who might be an impediment and focusing too little on those people who might help them, the people who might be an impediment actually become more of an impediment and make change more difficult. Secondly, with regard to implementation, what our research suggests is that we need to find from research evidence, conceptual tools and heuristics can, that can support professionals in actually making change happen. And these relate to student learning, for example, tools that can help educational professionals and medical educators make expert thinking visible so that it's more accessible for students to acquire and try and emulate. But also tools that can support professional discussions for learning in staff teams, for example, that can support faculty learning and implementation of new interventions in practice. Finally, then, evaluation and in particular also self-evaluation. Self-evaluation is very important as part of trying to assess how global, in other words, non-specific research evidence may or may not actually work in one's own local setting. But as I've already mentioned before, self-evaluating change efforts in our medical settings locally is also very important to manage the accountabilities that we find ourselves under showing to people we are accountable to that when we try to do something differently, we are monitoring it so that if it wasn't working or if it was producing even worse outcomes than before, we would actually be able to notice it. One of the things that we have found in our research is that innovation efforts in medical settings and other settings are often curtailed by participants and practitioners limited ability to articulate and then conceptualize desired learning outcomes. This is true not just in practitioner settings, but more widely in medical education research. And our research has shown that this applies to hard expertise. So in work that I've been involved in with colleagues um, on neurosurgery and simulations in neurosurgery education, for example, has shown that it was actually very difficult to evaluate the effectiveness of some of those new simulations because it turned out that there don't exist very good conceptual models or outcome measures that could measure the desired outcomes of some of the aspects of neurosurgery education that go beyond mere procedural, very specific skills. But it also applies to soft skills expertise. We have shown in our research that in clinical leadership development, there is a real shortage of outcome models and measures that are actually valid, that would help us evaluate if our educational efforts in that area are effective. But our most recent research has shown that this actually applies to all so-called non-technical skills. There is a, a shortage of cumulative valid measures for communication, for decision making, for interprofessional teamwork that are used systematically across studies to enable us both to evaluate our practice, but also to build a cumulative evidence base. And then finally, I wanted to illustrate this through an example from our own research that has developed an outcome model for clinical leadership development to help us evaluate conceptually, but also empirically our local provision. And while this research took place in the UK, what we have very specifically tried to do is demonstrate how we went about combining global evidence and local needs and evidence so that the model could be applied in other settings, even if the findings are not directly relevant. Because clinical leadership 
development that does not make people competent in addressing those local goals that are relevant in that local setting is no relevant clinical leadership development at all. So what we did is we looked at policy documents in our local setting. We said, what are the goals that are identified and the development needs in that local setting, which in this case was England and the NHS or the UK more widely. And we said, how is clinical leadership intended to in the policy documents to address those goals? And we identified that the things that needed to happen according to current policy goals are achieving change and transformation, which have failed in the context of multiple reorganizations that have not actually filtered to change in frontline practice, achieving more interprofessional collaborations that enable practitioners to deal with new demographics and multimorbidities, and cascading and speeding up good practice so that change happens more quickly. Links with the model that Monica talked about in her work. So to finish then, what we did is we took these goals that were identified in policy, we evaluated a clinical leadership development program, in this case, the chief residence program in the east of England. And we said, what are the competencies that practitioners appear to be developing at individual level, the bottom line on the slide, in a clinical leadership development program? And what evidence can we find in both quantitative and qualitative data that suggests a theory of change? mechanisms of change that might link those individual learning outcomes to organizational goals, which is the boxes in color that you can see in the middle. Now I'm just going to finish here. I didn't fit all the references on the individual slides. I'd like to very much acknowledge that this is a product of collaborative work with several colleagues that I'd like to demonstrate on this slide, but I'd be very happy to um, share with participants a slide set with references if that's something that people would like and my email is on the slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rika. Now we have time for questions. Um, how many people have we got, Fiona? Can we, can we share them all on the screen? Fiona, can you hear me? Yeah, hey, are you all right? Yeah. Can, is it possible to share everybody on the screen? Have we got... So um, people can share their, their videos if they want to, but everybody in here is in here. They don't have to share their videos. Okay, right. So those who would like to share their videos, please do so, so that we can see it might be a little bit more interactive. I think the main problem, uh, George or Fiona, is that one, we've got this sort of um, pin on the main speaker, which is at the moment is Fiona on my screen. Um, so I think that's different on everybody's screen. Um, so okay. you can change your settings by the view in the top right hand corner. Okay. And you can change right. it to speaker view right. or gallery view. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want to, we're, we're uh, uh, um, small enough number for people to just raise their hand either actually or um, graphically on the screen if they want to ask questions or um, to write them up onto the chat line. Monica, can I, um, sorry, over to George, <laughs> over to Bill, sorry. Thank you very much, Arthur. I think my job is to try and compare these question and answers uh, around this, but I'm very happy to uh, take it as we go. But first of all, just to thank uh, the speakers for two excellent <coughs> presentations. Um, found them very interesting and uh, very informative. Um, what I suggest in terms of questions, um, and as, as ever, there's three ways of raising a question. You can wave manically into your screen and we might spot you. Um, you can raise the purple or yellow or whatever color hand uh, is on Zoom uh, and we will probably spot you. Or you could just write it in the, um, in the chat line uh, where we, can, we certainly will um, uh, spot you. 
Um, someone, Fiona, has asked me to introduce myself uh, in the chat line, demonstrating how useful that mechanism is. Uh, I'm Bill Irish. I'm the Regional Postgraduate Dean for the East of England. Uh, I'm a fellow at Hughes Hall, uh, and I am interested in uh, uh, global health and particularly around education, uh, dating from humanitarian uh, work. I had the privilege of being involved with some years ago, uh, and I'm involved in a number of, sort of fellowship programmes which we, we run from this part of, uh, of England. So in terms of questions, I mean, I, I mean, I guess I, it falls to me maybe to sort of kick off with the first question and then uh, uh, encourage the rest of you to use that time to uh, uh, add, add your own in on, on top of that. I mean, my first thought is that there are a number of traditions of pedagogy uh, which, which relate to different professions, but also results, uh, result, uh, revolve around different uh, cultures and different countries. So, for example, didactic teaching is the default model for medical education in a lot in many parts of the globe, uh, but not necessarily in the UK. And I, I guess I, when we're talking about transfer, transferability of educational intervention, uh, I'm curious whether, Rika, you've, you've got any thoughts about how we we can sort of uh, acknowledge that and how we can flex our approaches so that it picks up both of the, you know, those different traditions. Thank you, Bill. That's a really very relevant question that we haven't always taken into account sufficiently as we sometimes consider certain countries to be outside the global mm -hmm. and somehow mm -hmm. the norm for others. I think there are um, two key things. Um, at least that are relevant here. So first one, rather than assume that certain forms of pedagogy, such as ones that are more dialogic rather than didactic, are valuable simply because in our settings, we know them and see them as valuable, rather than assume value to really have evidence that looks at what are the mechanisms that we assume to be behind the benefits of a, a more dialogic approach, for example, so that we can then compare that mechanism to cultural settings where such a model of pedagogy is not common. So rather than just tell them you should teach the way we teach because it works where we are, because this is how our students are used to living and they don't like being told by a teacher what to do. Is there a stronger underlying mechanism underneath it that actually says this is better for learning for these reasons? Hence, it's worth trying to implement it somewhere else, even if that's difficult. And if that criterion is fulfilled, then the second really key step that our research has suggested is that changing practice at that level of magnitude really requires a really fundamental change in the underlying norms of education that reach well outside individual lecture halls and that students bring with them into those lecture halls. And if those norms that are supposed to change are not in themselves made explicit to students and an explicit target of the change efforts, then simply changing the surface level of the pedagogy is unlikely to be successful. Thank you, Rika. Uh, Monica, I mean, you've got some practical experience of delivering a, uh, a teaching the trainers course. How did you adapt it to the different sort of pedagogic uh, styles which are uh, sort of uh, prevalent in the areas that you were you were interested in. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, first, the course that I'm referring to and that I talked about was something very short. So this was like a six-week course. So it's different mm -hmm. from a whole degree. I think what Trika refers to mostly. Um, so we got people from uh, twelve countries and. Uh, we encourage them to talk to each other. So whenever there was some concept that we taught in a very English or Western way, they had the chance to discuss it among themselves and then this encouraged them to ask questions and change a bit the pedagogy as we went along. Thank you. I've got a question from Esther, um, who wants to know a little bit more about um, other healthcare professions. Esther, do you want to expand on that? Uh, but you very kindly put it in the chat box, but uh, I'm sure there's more to it yeah, than uh, uh, just the one line. I shall introduce myself. I am Esther, um, and I am a pharmacist, um, and have led a pharmacist-led um, um, global health partnership recently with Sabaver in Ghana. So I suppose my question is, we've, I've heard a lot about the medical model and medical training. Um, is there shared learning to be had with the, you know, the pharmacy deanery, with other colleagues as well? Okay, 
um, either Monica or Rika, who would ever like to uh, leap in there. I mean, I think we could start off with pharmacy, but I think there are a wide number of other healthcare professions. And of course, they all uh, differ very much in the type of education which is prevalent within uh, each of those professions and the uh, also the intersectionality between the different professions, multi-professional learning and interdisciplinary learning is very important around there. Can you maybe sort of expand on how um, how you how we might tackle it? I mean, Monica, you must have had some experience of that in the in the course that you run. I'm sure it wasn't a uniprofessional audience. Um, did you have anything? You, you know, any reflections on that? Um, I, I wouldn't know how to comment on this because we haven't talked uh, worked with people from this area. Sorry. Okay. Well, Rika, do you want to uh, give us a bit more of a sort of uh, some, some some thoughts around that? Yeah, um, it's interesting. There is a fairly limited amount, as we have observed in our most recent um, scoping review, there's a fairly limited amount of conversation between the literatures and research um, of the different professionals, even though one of the areas we looked at was an interprofessional education in clinical settings, which fundamentally includes different professions. The way we have approached that is try and develop an understanding of the kinds of contextual factors that play a role in different settings. And if they apply in different cultural settings, then they would apply in different professional settings. So things such as um, what are the norms relating to expectations about teaching and learning? What are the accountabilities that are observed in a local setting? So there is a formal level, every setting will have norms, every setting will have accountabilities, but what those are populated with is specific to that local setting. And I think that approach would also apply in trying to transfer models from one profession to another, so again, the new profession in, in, in pharmacy education, for example, there will be certain normative expectations, um, how teaching might take place. There will be accountabilities that those students find key and hence they'll want to learn about those kinds of competencies. And so those could give a, a toolkit of the kinds of discussions that could be had to say to what extent does this knowledge apply to this setting. But I think there is definitely scope there for more research for the different literatures to talk to each other, particularly as, for example, nursing education has a lot more educational research um, than, for example, the medical context. Thanks. I mean, Arthur, you spent a lot of time during your uh, your time in frontline education looking at interdisciplinary learning in the in England. I mean, do you have anything that you could sort of maybe sort of throw into the conversation about what you learned there, which might be relevant in the global health context? Yeah, so we did quite a bit of research at Hertfordshire and uh, Anglia Ruskin on interprofessional learning in the various groups of people who are involved in what we called human, the human facing professionals that have to work together. And it started from safeguarding. Um, I guess we did have a pharmacist on board actually from Hertfordshire. Um, the, what we found was that the conversation that you needed to have with the teachers was to understand how what was, I guess it's part of the normative stuff, but what is the culture of their education? So how do you become a pharmacist? How do you become a policeman? How do you become whatever? And it's interesting how very few people know the pathway, the career pathway in educational career pathway to becoming that health professional. Sometimes doctors believe they know about nurses and nurses know about doctors, but actually when we came to ask the detailed questions, that clearly wasn't there. Uh, and the big one for everybody in the health profession was in fact about the police. Um, uh, when suddenly, uh, apparently, uh, as soon as you're given your warrant card, you are a full responsible policeman with all the duties and responsibilities of policeman, which happens about six weeks after you've done your prob probation course. And whereas health is almost quite the opposite. You, you spend all your time trying to achieve some sort of independence of practice. So getting that was very important. In, the, the work we did in East Africa and still doing in East Africa is, is an interesting one. And that's more to do with the hierarchies and getting people in a group to talk to one another when they don't belong to the right hierarchy. Uh, and this is beyond tribalism. This is just simply that um, doctors don't talk to nurses other than to issue instructions. Um, um, you'll never find a lab technician because they're always away doing something else on their own somewhere. Not true, but it's part of lots of stereotypes that grow up. So actually we've taken with them to actually get them to tell the stories of what they believe, what are the stories that are being told about the different groups. Um, and uh, that, that's been quite helpful. So that's a, I think that's about culture and norms really. 
but those are ways in which we've we've approached it. Okay, I'll see Nabil uh, and then Rika. You'll need to go off mute though, Nabil. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Hi, I'm, I'm Nabil Afar, I'm a, a fellow at uh, Hughes Hall. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Monica uh, a question. And uh, <clears throat> this relates to the fact that uh, uh, training individuals in, in, in bioinformatics uh, and the manipulation of the data um, is very important, of course, to extract uh, the messages from the data. But the other aspect of this is the support IT infrastructure, because you're um, going to be generating a lot of, 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 of data uh, from uh, a whole genome, genome sequencing analysis, and you've got to store this data. And I'm just wondering whether um, uh, that's a, uh, an issue in these different parts of the world uh, for those researchers where uh, perhaps that uh, IT support infrastructure is not there. Um, and if it's not there, then it's very difficult for these researchers to have ownership of that, that data if they have to then host that data um, in other countries, for example, such as servers at, at the Sanger. Uh, and I think that's quite an important issue in terms of um, uh, in data generated locally um, that reflects, uh, if you like, the pathogen landscape um, of that part of the world. Um, and a, a sense of ownership uh, of that data for those who are generating it. Um, would you like to comment on that? Yes, I can comment on that. So I'm also working, so I'm a postdoc at Sanger, but um, actually the course I presented here in, uh, in this conference is based on our experience to, with uh, in building capacity exercise, part of a global health research unit in uh, Colombia, Nigeria, India, and the Philippines. And what we have found, so we were talking uh, with either public health laboratories or academic laboratories to set up the surveillance units in these countries for, uh, for AMR. And uh, in, in this group, we did uh, capacity building at, on the lab, laboratory side, and also on bioinformatics. And what we found actually in this exercise of uh, capacity building for bioinformatics is that hardware and data storage and data processing is not the biggest issue at the moment because many things, many pipelines that are used in bioinformatics now can move to the cloud. So at the moment we can take software that's uh, it's in a container practically and we can run it anywhere in the world. So although some, some countries such as we had problems, for example, in Nigeria where they have uh, power cuts. So that's still a problem and they can only run their the pipeline when they have obviously electricity and so on. Yeah, but many, many things in bioinformatics now and data storage can be done in the cloud. So it all comes up to having internet access and having an interface. So that's not the biggest problem. Now we are talking about other, uh, other difficulties such as data integration. So for example, data comes from a uh, microbiology lab and then it's being tested by clinical microbiologists and then it comes to bioinform to sequencing and then to data analysis. And then data, for example, will change its IDs at each step. So many samples are lost along the way. So we are talking now about different challenges, not just about hardware and data processing. It's also about learning how to link data and how to interpret data. So I think this has been overcome a bit. The, the problem of hardware and computational power. Thank you, Monica. Yeah. Rika, you had um, your hand up earlier, um, and so I think we we probably stepped over you. But did you want to sort of refer back to an earlier point? Um, yes, I had a uh, response to an earlier point, but also if there is space, a question to Monica. But I don't want my question to take over if others want to ask a question. Um, I think very much to um, Arthur's response, also to Esther. I think it was about how people culturally perceive others. What we found in our clinical leadership development is that the two ways in which, in this case, medics tended to think of other, other groups of people, whether it was medics of other professionals or other clinical group professional groups, was either in terms of you know, how might they pose a barrier or how can I influence them to do what I want them to do? 
And while they were in the assumption, there was no reason for them to go further and explore what those other groups really knew and what they really wanted, because how they are a barrier, well, I know that from where I stand and how I can get them to do what I want them to do doesn't show an interest in their knowledge. Whereas when the course that they took part of in the clinical leadership development and chief residence got them to ask, what do others know that I don't know? that immediately changed their perspective, both on what other people could offer, increase their understanding of other people's expertise, but also showed the need for them to reach out across the us and them boundaries. And I think that applies both culturally, but it also applies across the professional groups. Um, but if there, is an, not, if, if there isn't another question currently, I was really interested in hearing from Monica, as you look at that process of impact where you have trained the trainers and then they go and do training in their own countries without that immediate support from your original trainer anymore, what kinds of um, factors did you find or did you look at at all at any of the factors that were most impactful in whether they were successful in spreading that learning impact in their own local setting? I think it's very important, it's a good question. And actually the people that uh, went on to teach others from our cohort, they all uh, had either uh, kept in touch with the original trainers, with the original instructors here at Sanger with this, this group, or they made uh, networks with other former trainees. So it's really important. I think it's also about, uh, I don't know if this is scientific, but it's a matter of confidence. In order to start your own training, you need to have confidence that you can do it. And then they needed to network with other trainers to, to exchange ideas or to get that boost. And we, uh, yeah, now part of this training, we are uh, planning to release like a set of ma um, manuals. And so we want to make some resources available so they can have ready-made resources to go teach later. Thank you both. Um, I've got a comment from Judy Willits in the in the chat line. Now, Judy, I can see you're still there, although your camera's off. I, I don't know whether you, you, you talked about your experience um, and whether you had any reflections on what you've heard ar around that. You're on mute if you're trying to talk to us, or you may be having a cup of tea. <laughs> Can't tell. I think it must be the cup of tea. Never mind. Okay. Um, well, I think that's um, Are you there, Judy? Excellent. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm desperately I'm trying to find the unmute key. I, I know, know it well. Yeah, I, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm actually <laughs> a PhD and I teach uh, entrepreneurship and uh, strategic management um, at the University of Hertfordshire. But I'm also pursuing a course in policy at the University of uh, um, Harvard University. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I would have. I, I could have done it at Cambridge, but I just wanted to try somewhere, somewhere else. Um, and at the moment, we've been looking at uh, the theory of change. Um, I took a project. You can see from my accent uh, in Kenya, although I've been based in the UK for the last twenty years, and I found the uh, contextual issues because Arthur did mention East Africa and therefore uh, issues of hierarchy, who talks to who and who can influence are uh, very important. Uh, but also um, a lot around um, what um, uh, Rika talked about in terms of um, uh, cascading and speeding up issues uh, without understanding, because we, we were talking about, I was looking at how I can impact women, you know, girls, get girls interested in, um, in science. And the reason I did that is because I was born in a small village in Kenya, but I've managed to achieve in a short, you know, short, whatever what I have. And even studying at, um, you know, teaching here uh, and also uh, studying at the University of Harvard. Um, so um, when I went back to Kenya uh, a few, um, last year, I went with some um, well, STEM subject videos and I found little girls who are really interested in understanding uh, what was going on, you know, they sat for hours trying to understand the mathematical concepts. Uh, so the interest was there, uh, but then the support wasn't there and the whole understanding. So uh, I'm quite really interested because I saw um, Rika's 
understanding of pedagogy and how it works within different contexts. Um, that was interesting to me. Uh, but the other reason um, I was interested in what you were doing from the medical side is because at the University of Hartfisha, we increasingly are te teaching the senior, senior leader. And many of the people who come to us are, for example, I've just supervised a, um, a, a, an assistant director who was looking at changing dynamics or what we call dynamic capabilities in the NHS. Uh, so I don't know how the NHS works. Eh? So um, um, when Arthur says, you know, this home facing profession, uh, 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 customer facing uh, professionals and um, what their lo job involves, for example, safeguarding, uh, when they come to me as a business <laughs> teacher, I don't know that their job involves safeguarding. Uh, what I'm applying to them are concepts we've learned how to teach business, you see. So um, this collaborative um, uh, knowledge you've talked about um, and how to build that uh, collaborative evidence base, Rika, uh, is quite valuable to me. So, <laughs> so I was just in the background. I thought, you know, it was last minute to try and jump into this to understand, but it's quite important uh, to me. Thank you so Thanks, much. Judy. Yeah, no, your contribution is very well received and thank you very much for sort of speaking up. It's very helpful to hear your perspective. I think we're probably just coming to the last few minutes of the session and I shall get severely told off if we if we overrun and stop you from going into the next on a timely basis. But I did just want to thank Monica and Rika uh, for their excellent and really stimulating presentations and um, certainly left me with some, 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 some thoughts really around uh, agency and hierarchies within uh, different cultural context. Um, the discussions we had on pedagogy I found very, very helpful. Uh, and the sort of slightly unresolved but very difficult area of interdisciplinary learning in a global health context, which I think is something which we, you know, we haven't paid enough attention to and probably one of those things that we, uh, we, we, we need to uh, you know, pay more attention to. But again, thank you very much for everyone for uh, being, uh, being here and for contributing to the discussion. Uh, and uh, hopefully you've taken away uh, a number of points which uh, will be useful and, and interesting. Uh, there's a couple of things in the uh, portal and in there, which I think just to draw your attention to in the chat line. Um, so um, if they're helpful, there are a few links which you can you can link in off there. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and um, uh, just surviving lockdown. And um, it's been a pleasure working.